I came here three years ago for the, um, uh, the, for the book festival and um, had really a very nice time. I was, <laughs> um, I was um, interviewed by a, a wonderful Japanese-American woman called Kyoko Altman who, who took me to Stanley Market to buy presents for my relatives. And uh, I rendezvoused with an old friend here called Steve McCarthy who I, I th think was working for a newspaper at the time then went on to edit um, the Asia... Asia Literary Review, and I'm rather miffed that he hasn't turned up to see me this time. <laughs> anyway, I'm only here for two days now, so um, I haven't really had time for tourism, sadly. Um, that is a shame, Mr. de Bernier. Yes, well, um, <laughs> the... <laughs> <laughs> the reason for the short trip is that I have to get home to look after my children on Tuesday. <laughs> um, so, how did you, <laughs> how did you sort of turn out to be a writer? How did, how did it happen? Well, <laughs> I, was, I was very, very lucky in the family that I grew up in. Um, my father uh, was a writer. He, he, um, he wrote poetry all his life. He's still writing poetry, probably one a month. And uh, it, it was old-fashioned poetry, but, um, but of very good quality. And it, he was always too diffident to publish it. And in the end, I published it, and I sold box loads. Um, but so in, in our house, it seemed perfectly normal to, to, to want to be a writer. You know, nobody told me to do something more sensible. <laughs> um, and I, I discovered after her death that my mother had also done quite a bit of writing... I found, I found a novella that she wrote. She, she was in Sri Lanka during the war when it was still Ceylon. And I found a romance that she had written after she... Um, and, and I'm determined to publish this in Sri Lanka. Um, it was set at the Mount Lavinia Hotel, this story. And um, I think um, I'm going to try and persuade the hotel to publish it and sell it to their guests. So I was lucky with both my parents. And I, I was equally lucky with... Um, the teachers I had in, my f in, my, in the two schools that I went to. In my, my first school, I, there was a very, very tall man who had actually written a book when he was a little boy, and the book was called Super Fun. He read it, he read it, uh, he read it to us once, and I've always, I, I intend to look on the internet to see if I can get it. But he, used to, he used to make us write one story every week. He made us memorize a poem every week, and I can still remember most of these poems. And once you've learnt the art of memorising, you can then use that for the rest of your life. I once even learnt a Chinese poem. Um, I could recite it to you. Okay. Right. I, can't, I can't recite it to you in Chinese. There was... You know there are so many different dialects. I, I just couldn't speak all of them. Um, but... Um, no, when, when, I was, when I was about 18 or 19, I found a little book published by Penguin Classics called Poems of the Late Tang. And it, it, the poems in there were beautiful. It was people like Lai Po and Tu Mu and Tu Fu and so on. I, I actually, I'm sorry, I can't remember who wrote this poem, but it went, By rivers and lakes at odds with life I journeyed, wine my freight. Slim waists of chew broke my heart. Light bodies danced into my palm. Ten years late, I wake at last with nothing but the name of a drifter in the blue houses. So, I don't know right um, so, he met, so this, this teacher made, made us memorize poems and um, he would give us marks out of ten according to how flawless it, the, the, the performance was. Um, but he also made us memorize proverbs and similes. Um, and I really do owe him an awful lot. And at, at the school I went to subsequently, I had two brilliant teachers. One was a really heavy-duty modern, modernist intellectual who made us all read all sorts of things that were not on the syllabus. Uh, he introduced us to T.S. Eliot, for example, who at first I thought was a complete fraud. And now I'm completely devoted to him. I think he's... He's a real poet's poet, you know, a marvellous poet. Um, he, he made us read D.H. Lawrence, who was then not taught in schools at all, and I suppose just beginning to come back into fashion for a while. He's now fallen out of fashion. 
But th this guy, Richard Osborne, he didn't really fit in with school life. That nothing made him more miserable than having to umpire a cricket game, for example. So in the end, he left and became a music critic. <laughs> um, he wrote a book on Rossini and another one on Herbert von Karajan, and actually quoted from one of my books, which rather flatteringly. Um, it's one of the lovely things about growing old as a writer. Is you, actually, you actually get to meet your heroes. When I was a young man, I was crazy about Latin American writing, and one of the Chilean writers I loved was Ariel Dorfman. Years and years and years later, I met Ariel Dorfman in Canada, and he told me how much he loved my books. I mean, what, what could be better than that? <laughs> anyway, the, the, the other teacher at this school had been an actor at, at the, with the Royal Shakespeare Company in Stratford, and he started to go deaf, and he thought you couldn't really be a successful actor if you were deaf. Uh, but so he decided to be a teacher, which is no good for a deaf person either, actually. <laughs> but he, uh, he didn't go as deaf as he, as, as he expected, but he loved teaching so much that he stayed on. He didn't go back to acting, but he was a brilliant actor. And so whenever we studied a text, especially if it was a play, he would act out all the parts. It was riveting. So when we did Othello... You know, one minute he was Othello stifling Desdemona, and the next minute he was Desdemona on the bed. Because you sort of, you know. <laughs> so, so, and he, he once gave me some extremely good advice. He said, you cannot consider yourself literate if you have only read literature from your own country. He said, if you want to consider yourself literate, you've got to read Flaubert, you've got to read Balzac. You've got to read the great Russians, you know, Turgenev, Tolstoy, Dostoevsky, um, um, Lermontov, and all of those people. So um, being, being impressionable, I suppose, and very impressed by him, I took his advice. And so all through my life, I have read literature from all over the world uh, as if it was my native literature. Um, so I've, I've never sort of got stuck in my own corner of the world in a literary sense. Um, Oh, Chip. <laughs> I was just, I was just uh, starting off saying how oh, I yes. came to be a writer. No, no, no. All right, okay. <laughs> it's all automatic here. Yeah. I'm mm. sure you could handle this <laughs> without my Chinese okay. uh, style of impunctuality. So I, I will finish what I was saying, then, okay. we'll, then, then we'll, um, we'll get back to plan Thank A. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so um, in, in, in my 20s, I got rather diver I always knew I was going to be a writer from the age of 12. It was just seemed to me inevitable. It was a vocation like wanting to be a, a nun or a doctor or something like that. But in my 20s, I was rather sidetracked by wanting to become a rock star. Um, I, I, I played with the band in Ipswich and, and so on and so forth. I wrote quite a lot of songs. And I, I, think, I think of that now as, as good practice for writing poetry. But... I, by the time I got to 30, I realized, I, A, I was not going to be a rock star, and secondly, I didn't even want to be one. And so in, in my 30s, I, I, I sort of refocused on writing. I, I wrote a very, very long novel, which was actually autobiographical, about the collapse of a love affair, and i would never published it, and I never will, because it was really it would be just too embarrassing. But what it did was prove that I could write a full-length novel, uh, that, was, that was worth knowing. And then, I suppose when I got to about 35, I had a very bad motorcycle crash on a Russian motorbike with a horizontal engine. Uh, the, the bike went over on me sideways and broke my right leg. So, okay, my Irish girlfriend went back to Ireland because she didn't want to look after me. My landlady had an emotional breakdown, so it was scary to leave my room. And... At the time, I was working as a uh, supply teacher in London, so I had no lesson marking to do and no planning to do. So in my free time, I really was free. And I found a short story that I wrote when I was freshly back from South America at about the age of 18. It was a story about how a group of soldiers go into a village, get drunk, throw a hand grenade, and kill several people. It's what, ha it's what happened in the village in Colombia where I was staying. And it was announced in the national media shortly afterwards that these soldiers had su successfully suppressed a communist uprising. 
Um, and I wrote this short story called How to Turn a Campesino into a Gorilla. And I found this short story and I thought, I know what, I'll write what happens next. And I wrote, and that turned into three novels, that, that short story. And really, that's what got me going um, as a writer. By the time I'd done three of those books, I was, I was earning enough money to give up being a teacher, which was my ambition. <laughs> and uh, and there, there I was, I'd become a writer. All right, over All to you, right. Chip. <laughs> <laughs> You've managed to uh, start off your, your book without a prefix, so mm -hmm. what else do you need? Certainly you don't need any footnote. No. especially from me, right? <laughs> but uh, thank you for your very rich uh, uh, self-introduction of uh, very colorful chronology, <laughs> right? But, uh, you know, I, I, my first question is how... I mean, we in Hong Kong uh, go to schools and universities and colleges on a very linear structure. We go to kinder's garden mm. and then primary school, secondary school, and then we face a choice uh, between uh, uh, going to, uh, uh, to uh, tr trying to get a place from the boarding school via the British Council or climb up the usual uh, academic ladder here. Uh, so that boring educational structure has been blamed for one of the major reasons of failure of generating any great novelists, right? especially compared to your background. Mm. Yes, but um, that may not be entirely fair because I went through the same academic um, uh, sort of process myself, um, except that I was in schools that did encourage creativity. If you've got, if you've got a school which is just focused on you becoming an accountant or a banker, uh, and, and isn't focused on developing you creatively, then, then th it, that's the problem rather than the academic ladder, I think. Um, I'm told that parents here want their children to be accountants and doctors and bankers and things and would be rather horrified if you said you wanted to be a dancer or a musician. Um, so in that sense, it would be the parents that are the problem and not the school. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, um, I'm... The, the 18th century composer, um, Handel, George Handel, his father wanted him to be a lawyer because it was a secure profession. And they were living in very uncertain times. And uh, a local aristocrat heard Handel playing the organ in his chapel when he was only nine years old. And this aristocrat said to Handel's father, it would be a crime if, if your son didn't become a musician. Um, he, said, he said, those who are good at what they do deserve honor at whatever they do. And uh, this is true. I think, I think the, the attitude should be that you've got to detect what your children are good at and then encourage them to do it. You can't force them to be good at something which doesn't come naturally. Does that make sense? <laughs> so I, I would look... Well, firstly, are the schools encouraging people to be creative? And secondly, do the parents have the right attitude? I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have got anywhere without my parents, I don't think. I was saying my, my father is a poet, and he was perfectly happy for me to become a writer. Do you think writing can be academically taught? Do you believe in the th sort of things like creative writing workshop? Well, that is a good question. I have often taught on creative writing courses. <laughs> You've taught in the comprehensive school. Yes, but I've also, I've also taught creative writing courses in Calgary in um, Canada. And I've done several bilingual ones in France. And I've done several in Greece. And what I found is that you, you, know, you, can, you cannot actually make someone talented who isn't. So, w but what I did find was that people are often deluded about what they think they ought to be writing. So, I had a Hungarian countess called Germaine, who turned up in Greece, who wanted to write literary fiction. And it was obvious to me, from, from the way that she was writing and the way she was speaking and acting, that she ought to be writing erotica. So, <laughs> so I said... <laughs> I, s I said to Germaine, you, you, you actually you ought, you ought to be writing saucy stuff. You shouldn't, you shouldn't be trying to become Tolstoy. And, 
And, and I was right. You know, she did have a talent for that. And the, um, Malcolm Bradbury, who was, the, I suppose, the most famous teacher of creative writing courses in the world in his time, he set up the creative writing course in East Anglia. His talent was not in making other people talented. It was in finding talented people and then bringing their talent on. And he didn't care whether you were going to be a journalist or a historian or a biographer. He, he spotted your talent and he guided you. He, he showed you how to become better at that. So, you know, it, it would be absolutely no good taking on somebody, you know, who's basically not much more talented than a golden retriever. So. <laughs> yeah, he was there. In, <laughs> he was there in East Anglia. I think yeah. he started off that idea yeah. in the UK. Yeah. At that time, in the, uh, back in America, say in uh, Iowa, you know, there were a couple of uh, creative writing workshops there. That's right. Yes. And that very idea had been uh, uh, um, uh, 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 had been imported from mm. the other side of the Atlantic. Yeah. And as a young academic at about that time, mm. you know, I didn't, I strongly, I was strongly skeptical about it because yeah. how would you attend a creative uh, writing class? at punctually nine o'clock mm. and then you know sit there and be lectured by someone and or be told by someone to well, take out a piece of paper and mm. with your pen and write a poem straight away yeah. and then get it assessed. No, you it's absolutely can't be done. Mm. Um, one thing that that some universities have done is find writers who are prepared to be mentors. Mm. To, to, so I, I mentored a young woman called Naomi who was who was wanted to be a poet who was at Bath University. And I, I sort of, she used to send me her poems every now and then, and I would get in touch with her now and then. And uh, that, was a good, that was quite a good way of doing it. Um, so that, because um, you, you, you don't want to be writing in a vacuum. It is always a problem with academia that, that they will um, s sort of lose touch with reality. They, they, they might encourage you to write something extremely complicated, the stream of consciousness which is actually unpublishable and no one will want to read, and out of context. So I only use stream of consciousness when I want to express confusion or extreme emotion. Then it's very effective as a technique. It's not an end in itself. You know, then academics sometimes forget that kind of thing. Um, I would blame that. Yeah. I would blame that on uh, some academics who uh, yeah. get themselves indulged on writers like Virginia Woolf and... Uh, <laughs> William Faulkner and mm. uh, the worst, James Joyce. Yeah. I mean, the Dubliners is a, is a masterpiece mm. and uh, some part of the portrait uh, of an artist. Yeah. Right? And yeah. some, you have some lyrical, uh, beautifully lyrical paragraphs, mm. but uh, Ulysses you know, is still very mm. much a challenge mm. to an average intelligent yeah. uh, reader's mind. I think. The, the point about those kinds of difficult modernist books is that there's probably not much point writing any more of them. You can't add much to Faulkner. You can't add much to Joyce. No. It's like the same is true of really, really vile books. So, you know, I, I, did, I did think for a while I wanted to write something absolutely disgusting. But if you've read Last Exit to Brooklyn or American Psycho, you realize it's already been done and you can't really go any further. <laughs> you know, right. there's, there's no point in wanting yeah. to be Virginia Woolf anymore. That's right. So yeah. up to what, the 1920s or 30s, yeah. you, know, you, are, you are under the, uh, the impression that they have exhausted with, uh, with uh, uh, skills, new skills and techniques mm. of writing. Mm. Right. Until, I think someone, you mentioned the other day, Nabokov, yes. the Russian-American mm. writer. Mm. He was sort of you know, really intelligent. Yeah. I, in school, uh, in university, I read one of his works called Pale Fire. Mm. You know, I wonder if you come across that. It's a long, uh, footnote, long footnoting of a very obscure long poem written by a, a poet. And then you have to dig into that labyrinth, that maze of uh, poetic glossary in order to find out that the poet as a writer has been a political dissident. So during the process, when he writes this poem, he is uh, on, he's being chased by an assassin mm. sent from, I think, what the Soviet Union or whatever, and then he, he becomes paranoid. So when he is par he's paranoid, and then he writes this long poet poem, 
which is、uh, whose obscurity becomes clearer and clearer with all the footnotes. And、ah. uh, and the glossary, you know, it's so carefully designed. But, That's very clever. But I'm sure this is not <laughs> definitely. This is not the the kind of things you know. Well, very much welcomed by a publisher even in Bloomsbury now. <laughs> 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 no. Have you tried? To, well, say, I mean, some of your novels, you know, the forms are、uh, pretty. You know, look pretty unorthodox. <laughs> well,、Have、um, you try new form. <laughs> I was, I was again. I was rather lucky, and I, I, I did a master's degree in English language and literature in education. And one of the one of the components of the course was studying postmodernism. And although, well, I, I'm not a postmodernist, but I decided to be a good thief. I, I have stolen everything from postmodernism that I need. So I would, I have multiple narrators. For example, I will have chapters which are letters. I'll have a chapter which might be a shopping list. I, I, I've, I've, I've sort of embraced the freedom and the, the idea of creative chaos that you get from postmodernism without actually being a postmodernist myself. So, so you, you could, if you wanted to, classify me as a postmodernist writer, but actually, I'm an extremely old-fashioned one.、Mm. I believe in narrative and character. Well, so much the better, <laughs> because I don't think、um, many writers or novelists could be as lucky as someone like Umberto Eco,、mm. right? Who's written, you know, brick thick、uh, novels of、mm. postmodern works, you know,、yeah. Foucault's Pendulum and The Name of、yeah. the Rose. And fortunately,、uh, one or one of、uh, mm. these two has been adapted into a film,、yeah. uh, which is now. You know, coming to your. I think I think Echo Echo is an interesting case of somebody who is naturally a philosopher. He's a, he's actually a great semiologist who 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 is interested in the way that、um, signs refer or indicate meanings, and and th- this is th- you have you can't really read Echo unless you know this. Yeah, but some hate him or detest him、yeah. because he looks he sounds a bit、uh, pretentious.、Mm. Right and too、yeah. eager to show off his erudition,、yeah. right, especially the,、uh, the in the name of the rose. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's that kind of strange European style, you know, dated、mm. back from to Thomas Mann and、uh, others. Yeah, Marcel Proust.、Right? So, sometimes on the continent, especially in France, you get a preoccupation with style at the expense of everything yeah. else. Yeah. So you get acres and acres of beautiful writing about nothing much. And English novels <laughs> are compared, well, comparatively speaking, more down to earth, right? Yeah, I yeah. think so. Yes. Loose,、uh, well, laconism,、mm. right, and、mm. preciseness,、mm. using the simple language to just to tell a story. That has more or less、uh, been the tradition of English novels. It's true, but I, I don't classify myself as a simple writer. I, 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 I do. I love the versatility and exuberance of language. So, I, I don't, I don't think my style is particularly simple.、Um, it's not as simple as most British or American writers, I don't think. But then, if you look at some writers who are. Everybody says that they're simple and sort of pared down. For, the, for example, Hemingway.、Mm. If you actually read a passage of Hemingway, it's not simple and pared down at all. He seems to have acquired this reputation without earning it. <laughs> <laughs> so, and and there are French writers who、mm. are exceptions. So I love the, those little novels of Françoise Sagan.、Mm. Which she, they're perfect for reading on long train journeys. Because they're short and they're beautiful, they're written in beautiful, elegant, simple French.、Mm-hmm. Whereas, I, I really, really cannot read Zola in the original. It's just, it's <laughs> just too difficult.、Yeah. I can、right. read Camus in the original. Yes. Yeah. Well, I'm a Louis.、Uh, well, it's a polygon, and、uh, <laughs> you、uh, claim that you、uh, speak French, you know, right? I do speak、I'm、French.、Sure. Yes. You know, you do, right? Do you want to try <laughs> me out? <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> so, who, are, who, who are your favourite、uh, French、uh, novelists then? Data back to three hundred. Well, Marcel Proust. No, <laughs> Pr- um, the Proust there is too much text with too little happening.、Yeah. Um, there was a writer from the nineteen thirties called Georges Duhamel who who、mm. wrote what he called the Roman Fleuve, where、mm. one novel flows onto another without it actually being a,、mm. a trilogy or a tetralogy or whatever.、Mm. They were they were cyclical books. There was the the, the Salavan cycle, for example,、mm. the Pasquier cycle. And they they were about 
rather unimportant people, um, look, you know, little petty bourgeois who, who, who really were never going to accomplish anything, but were sort of interesting in their own right. And an analogous British writer was, Fra was uh, Barbara Pym, who, you know, who, who, wrote, who wrote about people in villages who, who no one else was bothering to write about. Um, I also love, uh, I loved Camus. Um, I liked the novels of Jean-Paul Sartre, but not his philosophical texts. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think my favorite French writer must be, um, must be um, Flaubert. Mm -hmm. Madame um, Bovary. Madame Bovary, mm -hmm. I can read over and over again. Mm -hmm. I, I'm in love with Emma Bovary. I think mm -hmm. I always will be. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Well, at that time, you know, it was uh, the budding uh, mm. period of feminism. Yeah. Right? And also, what about Balzac? Right? Balzac is... Uh, yes, yes, I, I do enjoy Balzac, mm. and particularly um, Le, P Le Père Goriot, yeah, you know, yeah. Father Goriot, I love that mm. one. Mm. 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 But again, he's quite hard work in the original. Yeah, in the original. You know, yeah. I haven't tried that. You know, yeah, I was read work. <laughs> off for the easy mm. route uh, by reading a, a Penguin classic uh, mm. translation. Now, you, you've, you've taught at a comprehensive school, Yes. right? That means teenagers, yeah. secondary schools. Yeah. How did that experience uh, inspire you? Well, it was so stressful. What did you What did you teach? Latin, English? No, no, no. Mm -hmm. um, I originally was teaching philosophy to adults, mm. uh, which which <laughs> was which was actually I enjoyed a lot because um, philosophy is my subject. Um, but w when when I I became a secondary teacher. I, I, I was trained to teach English and drama, and I wasn't very good at either. Um, the English at that time had become curiously, um, it had had all the, continent, all the content sucked out of it. Um, it used to be about, you know, you will learn these, these, you have to spell these ten words by next week. You will, you, will anal you will do this exercise on clause analysis. You, do you used to do dictations. You used to do summaries and um, you know, abbreviations. There were all sorts of things one did in English. And this suddenly disappeared about the time when I became an English teacher because it then became all about empathy. So imagine you, know, imagine you are a fish in the bottom of somebody's boot. Describe your thoughts and feelings. And it was it That's was just it was just dreadful, and so the, the children the <laughs> children rebelled because there's nothing the children know when they're being tricked or, or 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 they know when they're bored, they they know when a subject is irrelevant because it has no content, and so it was very very hard to teach English at that time. Um, when I became a supplier, and I used to have a riot every lesson, and it was it was nothing to do with education, it was just riot control. And then when I became a supply teacher later on, and I had, I had to supervise maths classes and design and technology classes and science classes, the kids behaved perfectly because they were doing a subject where there were answers and where there was a very specific content. Um, so I stopped being an English teacher after three years, and after that I became a supply teacher where I had to teach anything at the drop of a hat. And I learned a lot of useful things. I, I mean, I, I, can do, um, I can do technical drawing. I can do isometric drawing. You know, how I bet you there's no other British writer that can do isometric drawing. <laughs> so um, so, so it, it, one, thing, one, thing, one thing that was very positive about having been an English teacher was that I read a lot of children's books. And I lost my snobbery about children's literature. A lot of the best writing back then was being done by the writers of children's books. Um, and also, I, I had to read a lot of drama, being a drama teacher. And it, I, I'd never really bothered with the theatre much before. But now, now I'm much more keen on the theatre. So it, it did leave me a positive legacy. But I think the most wonderful thing about school children, about however riotous they were, or badly behaved, or difficult, was that their marvellous humour so whenever anything happened, the day after, the school was full of jokes about it. You know, really bad taste jokes. <laughs> and the, 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 one, the one thing I miss, really, about, about leaving teaching is that nobody tells me jokes anymore. 
So did you earn a few very nasty nicknames behind your back? <laughs> I'm not aware. Or oh. seen as an eccentric? Well, I had, I, there was a very sweet little girl called Joanna Bush who objected to me eating garlic. Mm. And she, she used to call me Mr. Garlic. <laughs> but I think that's the worst nickname I had. Mm. Did you spot any young writing talents? There's a theory that uh, musical talents could butt and flourish like Mozart at yeah. a very early age, but not writing. You've got to leave it until, what, early 20s at least, you know, until you get a bit mm. mature, after you've undergone ups and emotional yeah. ups and downs. I think that's true. Um, I, I, you can't help noticing that most women writers hit their stride when they're about 28. You can, of course, think of exceptions like Jeanette Winterson, who started when she was something like 20. And most men don't seem to hit their stride until their mid-30s. And th there's a curious thing about poetry, which is that you often, you often get a rush of poetry, say, in your late teens or, or when you're a teenager, and then it deserts you, it abandons you, and then it comes back to you when you're middle-aged. I can't explain this, but it seems to be the way it is. What about middle age? Some argues that as you grow, one grows older, his analytical power becomes stronger, mm. but at the same time, the imagination could go on a bit of a decline, contrary to youth. Right? When you're young, you're more imaginative, you're more sensitive with colors and forms and whatever, but you, you don't make sense. As far as sensibility is concerned, it's a little bit backward. But as you grow older, it's the other way around. Now, at it, your age, well, do you... Well, there's an intersection, perhaps, when you're at your prime. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I know that... Um, Shakespeare... Yes, when you're, when you're, when you're, when you're young, you, you, you don't really have sufficient experience to, to understand the world or your place in it. It's still the booming, buzzing confusion that William James met, talked about, which babies suffer from, he thought. We, we are too confused. We're confused about, you know, if you're artistic, the on-principle confusion is knowing what your particular voyage is going to be. Where is your path? When you're young, you're taking the path, all the paths that are actually leading to the path. When you're young, you're not, you're, not, you're not actually on the path. You're on the path leading to the path. Does that make sense? So, so and there, there does come a time when you realize you are on the path and, and, you, and you, you forge ahead. I think the big difference between the young and the old, perhaps, is that the old are less impressionable. So I went to Colombia when I was 18 for a year. It was exactly the right time to go because... Colombia was so different from Britain, so exotic, so lively and exuberant, so violent, um, that I had never seen anything like before it, and I was just amazed. And it, 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 it sort of got into my imagination in, and, and never came out. Now, if I went to, say, Venezuela or Peru or Brazil now and stayed there for a year, I would be far less impressed because in a sense I've seen it all before and I wouldn't notice all the things that I would have noticed when I was 18. But I, I suppose as you get older, with any luck, your literary skill gets greater and you can compensate for being less amazed by the world. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you were born with uh, writing talents, right? I but so. that, they, they, these have been enriched by your traveling experiences. Much, much colors have been added to, uh, mm. to your work. Uh, you could always see the golden sunbeam in some of your books, like uh, Captain Corilla's uh, mm. Mandolin. You know, it's so colorful. But have you ever imagined, had you stayed in that, on that little island called England, and uh, not, uh, had not uh, traveled that expen extensively, what kind of novelist you would have become? Well, I, I know the answer to that. Um, when, when I first realized I was going to be a writer, well, I lived in an English village, and I started writing stories, very, very old-fashioned anachronistic stories about squires and dairymaids and things, and because that seemed my natural medium. 
But I, I realized, whoa, very quickly that that was a dead end. I think if I had stayed in England and become the average sort of cynical British intellectual, I would have ended up writing sort of rather cold metropolitan novels in which nobody is over 30 and everybody is horrible to each other and somebody dies of cancer. <laughs> so that, that's what it would have been, yeah. <laughs> So, I mean, well, I mean, I'm, I got to come to the topic you hate so much. It's about that film, oh, right. starred by Nicolas Cage. And I heard that the Greek government is about to name one of the islands as, as Captain Corelli's Island or something like that. Or they have ever had the thought? No. You know, people <laughs> are <laughs> Well, in order to save, some, uh, what, uh, what, to save itself from uh, the credit crunch? They I are. They are thinking of selling some of the islands. Um, that's true. Some of the islands are being the sold. The film has done very well. It, it did, yes, it, In did, it did. parallel, did quite well, yeah. books, yes. Um, th there are people on the island who who obviously have taken commercial advantage of this novel. So, for example, you can go on a bus tour, a Captain Crowley bus tour on Kefalonia, and I'm lying to put on a false moustache and go on it. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, that that is true, and th th there is, for example. A, a Captain Corelli Taverna, which I'm sure used to be called Zorba's. And as soon as, as soon as my book has been forgotten, it will go back to being Zorba's. <laughs> but the, the Kefalonians, the Kefalonia is a very left-wing island, mm. and they, in general, didn't like my opinion of the, um, what the communists did during the Second World War. <laughs> the communists on Kefalonia didn't kill a single Italian or German, but they killed a lot of other Greeks. So <laughs> I think they're low life. And be but because it's such a left-wing island, I'm never going to have a statue on Kefalonia. Uh, I don't think I'm ever going to have an island named after Captain Corelli either. It's also, it would annoy me because it, it isn't, the Kefalonia, for example, isn't Captain Corelli's island. It's a Greek island. It belongs to the Greeks. If you think ca 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 the character of Captain Corelli comes in as an invader with a, with a foreign army, and it, it, it wouldn't, I, I, would, I would find it morally objectionable if things got changed to Captain Corelli's, you know. <laughs> well, the occupied period of, uh, mm. of, of that island, Italian occupied period of that yeah. island during the Second World War, yeah. is a very neglected, um, tiny chapter, you know, by most writers or historians, mm. you know. Yeah. Yes. Um, it, it, was, it was neglected. Um, th there were war trials after the war. Um, General Lance was, was sort of um, absolved, really, uh, because the man who actually did the massacres was a man called Major von Hirschfeld, who was an Alpine uh, officer. The, the Germans realized that th they would not be able to get their own garrison to, to massacre the Italians because they were friends. It was a risky thing to try and get your own garrison to do. So they brought in a regiment from elsewhere, an Alpine regiment under Major von Hirschfeld, uh, to, to do the massacres, um, which he did with great efficiency. Not long afterwards, Major von Hirschfeld was killed in Poland, so there couldn't be any war trial, you know? And the, the Italians have an embarrassing war record, let's face it. They started on the wrong side, fought extremely incompetently and then ended up, ended up on the right side, but again, pretty useless. So they, 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 for a long time, they, sort of the war became something um, that was, you know, not really talked about. But uh, the, um, they, did, they did publish a very interesting book called Italiani Dovete Morire, which, you know, Italians, You Must Die, which is an account of the massacre. So... And um, re recently, because of Captain Corelli's mandolin, there's been a lot more controversy about it, and, and, uh, I, and I think they're having a public inquiry. Yeah. So what about your Latin American trilogy, right? Mm. That uh, seems to be a rather on an epic scale, right? Yes, my, my first three books were a Latin American trilogy, and, and they were magic realist, 
and they were political realists, mm. and the, the language was really very exuberant and quite complex. Um, and they also, they're full of a sort of a young man's energy. I can't write as energetically as that now. Uh, and I don't want to either. Um, but they, it came about because of uh, coming home to England. I, I went from this very um, uh, lively, interesting place to a city called Manchester, mm. which was an industrial town whose industries were failing. There was a lot of unemployment, everything was broken, everything was filthy, it rained all the time. The, the northerners are very snotty about southerners, so I was called a southern woofty. I was insulted for being, for being southern and so on. I, I didn't have a happy time in Manchester. Um, especially as in my first year, I fell in love with this beautiful, green-eyed, blonde French girl who later turned out to be a lesbian. Anyway, um, <laughs> so um, I was miserable there, and, and I, I, I stayed in Colombia in my mind. And so throughout, throughout my 20s, I was reading nothing but Latin American writers from the great Latin American boom. I mean, you can reel off a lot of names, but it's, it's not necessary. I was reading those writers while all of my contemporaries were reading Martin Amis, basically. And, and I do think that, that we are very like computers. In that you, if you put nothing in, you get nothing out. If you put rubbish in, you get rubbish out, which is why I don't read newspapers. And, and, and lastly, you tend to get out the same kind of thing as you put in. So because I was reading nothing but Latin Americans, when I finally settled down to writing, I was writing as a Latin American. And I, I stopped after three books because I was very bored with the magic realism. I got fed up with it. It makes plotting too easy. It, it's too whimsical. But at the time, I found it liberating because anything whatsoever could happen. But the, uh, there were going to be five of these Latin American books, and the, the next one was going to be a satire on a Latin American dictator. But just when I was about to write it, all of the Latin American republics democratized, except for Cuba. And Franco wasn't quite mad enough to satirize, really. Uh, Franco, not, not Franco, I mean Castro. Castro wasn't quite mad enough. It is true that he did eight-hour speeches, which is just appalling, he sort of bored the Cubans into submission. Um, and he did lock up writers and musicians in a big way. But he wasn't actually a sort of lunatic like so many uh, dictators have been. And so it didn't seem worth writing a novel just because there was one dictator left. And, and that was what prompted me to give up the, the Latin American vein and to look elsewhere for, for my subject matter. Well, that's one thing we could be certain. You haven't been indoctrinated after... Uh, what excessive reading of Latin America by its uh, left-wing ideology. It's true <laughs> that general it, it's true that um, a great many of them are like the poetry of Neruda. Oh well, I love Neruda. Yeah, well, yes, but uh, um, as, as a poet, yes. I think I, I've never allowed my political opinions to get in way in the way of my How artistic do you appreciation. Your love for Neruda and your and your apathy for the Guardian. <laughs> well, um, how can, well, the, the, Guard, the Guardian just gives you disinformation, whereas Neruda gave you great poetry, like his book of odes, you know, uh, his, the Ode to Wine, for example, which I love, day-coloured wine, night-coloured wine, wine with amber feet, and it's, it's just wonderful An stuff. authentic pa passion. Yeah, yeah. Nazim Hikmet, time. I love the poetry of Nazim Hikmet, who's a Turkish communist. Um, he, he I think he died too early to have become disillusioned himself, but I think he would have done eventually. Um, uh, a good example of a Latin American writer who started off on the far left and then gave it up is Mario Vargas Llosa. He allegedly had a fist fight with Gabriel Garcia Marquez about it, uh, although it might have been about a woman as well. Um, so the, the Latin American writers didn't actually get stuck on the left, uh, though Marquez did. But the, the, other, the others made the same progress as European intellectuals did, which was, which was slowly realizing, understanding the limitations of that kind of socialism. So it's the famous, what, is it not Bernard Shaw saying, when you're young, you know, you were, you were socialist, right? I think you Winston Churchill fool. said that. Oh, okay. he, said, he said something like, if, if, you're, if you're not a socialist when you're young, you have no ideals. Right. 
And if you're not a conservative when you're old, you don't have any brains. <laughs> that's very true. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's very it's true. It's sort of partially true, I think. I wouldn't, I wouldn't go all the way. <laughs> I'm, politically speaking, I'm very fanatically in the middle. Mm, right. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you did go to the same military school as Winston Churchill, right? Well, yes, I, I, I did have a, br a brief time in the army, but mm. um, oddly enough, b being in the army doesn't automatically make you into a conservative. Mm. Um, it, it's very easy to stereotype military types, mm. um, but because, because of, you know, I come from a military family, I know they're not all like that. There actually are British army officers who vote Labour. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> right. But now it's a bit of a rarity because you used, more than British literature used to flourish with uh, military uh, writers like Sassoon, Owen, you know, Ro Rupert Brooke, and mm. name it, uh, T.E. Lawrence, right? Mm. Do many servicemen still now uh, write I after they come back from Afghanistan or Iraq? Well, I think they are writing, but they're having a difficulty getting published. Mm. Um, after the Vietnam War ended, there was a great rush of Vietnam War literature, and there actually did become a point where publishers were saying, we can't take any more of this, it's been done, please don't write any more. But with Afghanistan, yes, the soldiers are writing about it actually, but they're not getting published. I, I recently read a really good novel by a, an Afghan, Afghanistan um, uh, veteran. Um, he had well, I don't need to tell you what he did, but, but he, he, this was a good story, and, but he couldn't get it published. And I tried to help him get it published, and I couldn't. Um, but I, I, it may be true that the tradition of the, the British uh, sort of scholar soldier or soldier poet uh, is, is on the decline, I suppose. That we had Sir Philip Sidney, most famously. There was a Field Marshal, Field Marshal Lord Wavell, who was, was very interested in poetry and wrote it himself. He, he published an extremely influential anthology called Other Men's Flowers. Um, I haven't noticed anything very much like that recently. But of course, those First World War poets were not, they, they weren't actually professional soldiers. They only, they only joined up because it was what one had to do as one's duty. They felt it their duty to join up. They are probably people who wouldn't have been soldiers if there hadn't been a war, right? Yeah. Especially in the First World War. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Mm. So, well, in China, in Hong Kong or Taiwan, many young, uh, uh, passionate writers don't get their works accepted or judged past by publishers, so they put on their work. They put their work on the internet, mm. right? And then when the internet gains a rather high hit rate, publishers would find find him and then back him to do, to get the work uh, into a publication, mm. right? Is there such a phenomenon in the Western literary world or the internet, I, I, cyber age? I honestly don't know the answer to that. Um, I've, I've got nothing against the electronic media. I, I, I just have no interest in it whatsoever. So I, I don't know what's happening. Um, and I, if that is happening, that, that people are getting published because of a, a, the number of hits, then that must be a good thing. And I do actually think that's what happened with Fifty Shades of Grey, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. I, I haven't that's read... The, that's it started off as an internet book. Mm. I haven't actually read it. I have no idea if it's any good. But that is one that, be that sort of became a worldwide phenomenon, having started on the internet. Mm, right. yeah. And how do you get on with your art, if you with your literary critics? Do you get, well, occasionally very hostile reviews? I, I've, I've been lucky. I've had very, very few nasty reviews. Right. I, I had one in the Kirkus the Kirkus review in, in the USA where my, for my first novel. And the writer of this review said that my novel was dreadful and that it was about a jungle girl who turns into a cat and brings down the government. <laughs> and I thought, well, that's a really brilliant idea, but <laughs> they, 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 they cannot possibly have read the book. Um, so when you know they haven't read the book, it doesn't hurt quite so much. Um, and I, I did have a hostile, I did have a hostile review on television for Birds Without Wings by this very lugubrious and irritating Northern Ireland poet who's usually drunk. And 
I sort of feel that being slagged off by him is a compliment. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I had a hostile review from somebody called Peter Kent, mm. who actually much earlier had given me a very positive review for another book. So there you go. You know, you win some, you lose some. <laughs> I'm not really that bothered. I, I mean, I, I feel I know what I'm doing, and um, I've, I've got enough faith in myself not to be sort of demoralized by mm. other people's bad mm. opinions. Mm. Yeah. Or do you ever get uh, some, any excessive interpretation that may have oh, this is wonderful. Academics. more insight in uh, uh, fed, uh, uh, feedback to you? Right. Uh, academics are a wonderful source That's of right. entertainment to me. <laughs> um, They're not. Yeah. <laughs> you know how the French are completely obsessed by the body? Yeah. Everything's, everything's got something to do with the body. And a, 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 French, a, French, a French academic called uh, uh, Jean-Paul Chevalier, I think his name was, he wrote this whopping great thesis about my, about my work, you know, the body and the work of Louis de Bernier. And I, I read this, it just made me smile so much. And I, I had, I, there was a young Greek boy who got absolutely obsessed with any reference to prostitution in my work. And he, he, he wrote a thesis about prostitution in the work of Louis de Bernier. And it, and it was obviously, he was just suffering from sexual frustration, really. <laughs> well, why not? Could be another three hundred years. There yeah. could be volumes of uh, criticism on uh, yeah. what the what the, um, the 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 dark stratum, the dark stratum of this erotic psychological world of Louis de Bernier, right? Your well, repressed desire for prostitution, you know, could yeah. have been I should, generated. I should, be I should be immensely entertained by it. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, right, you know, um, any questions to be invited from ladies and gentlemen on the, on the floor, readers? Yes, the gentleman there. The, uh, the book, the novel that you talked about, the first one that you wrote, for, oh, yeah, thanks. The, the novel that you wrote uh, really for yourself about your relationship, you said will never be published. Uh, would you consider that was finished, or you know? Because oh, it's, it's definitely finished. But I mean, <laughs> it's not the relationship. I mean, the book. I mean, <laughs> they're both they're both long gone. Um, as I say, it was it was a catharsis for me. I wanted to explain to myself what had happened and why. Um, so in the, it was sort of psychologically and emotionally useful thing to have done. Um, but it was of no literary worth or interest whatsoever. Um, and as I said, all it did was, te was would make me realize that I could write a full-length book. And it also made me realize how, how you do it. You, you do it one step at a time. If, if, you, if you think of what an appallingly vast task writing a novel is, you would never set about doing it. It's not as bad as having to write a PhD. That's a lot worse. <laughs> much harder work, but, but writing a novel, is, it's, it's, a, it's a gargantuan task. And, 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 but, but just writing one little episode every evening when I got in from work, it, it eventually amounted to a substantial amount of text. And I was amazed by how, actually how quickly it all mounted up into something book-sized. Um, I was just thinking yesterday that if you wrote one poem a year between the age of 20 and 70, it's not a lot, is it? But you would still end up with a nice book of 50 poems at the end of it. So, um, as I say, all, all it taught me was, was, was that it, it can be done. It's, it's really, I, I must remember to destroy it before I die. Because <laughs> the last thing I want is academics getting their hands on that. Especially psychologists. <laughs> Somebody there. Um, quite, quite a few of your books, you uh, talk about the role of religion in oh, yes. the cultures you're, you're writing about. And I was interested, do you have religious beliefs and how has your research affected that? Because you sometimes show a very dark side to Christians and Muslims killing each other and so on. And uh, if you do have religious beliefs or not, how do you think that affects your writing? Okay, this, this is a very complicated question, really. Um, 
yeah, I was brought up an Anglican, and my, my faith was pretty solid, until I saw a young woman killed in a railway accident in South America. She, she had, um, we had been chatting in the train, and she was called Maria. She was wearing rather high heels, and she offered to go and get me a beer. And she, she tottered off up the carriage. And in, in Colombia then, there was no concertina between the railway carriages, and she fell out sideways when the train jolted. And she fell onto the embankment at high speed and took all the flesh off her on the left-hand side. And we were hundreds of miles from a hospital. There was general hysteria on the train, because the train, the train had to back off and pick her up. And she took two hours to die. And I, I had what you might call a reverse Dam Damascus, Damascene conversion. You know, you know, St. Paul became a Christian on the road to Damascus in a sort of flash of light. And I, I, I lost my religious faith in a similar instant because I thought there just is no moral order in the universe. If God exists, he doesn't give a damn. And it, it was very disappointing and disorientating. And it, it vaguely relates to a disappointment I had when I was confirmed. When I was confirmed at the age of 13, I was expecting that when the bishop put his hands on my head, the Holy Spirit would descend on me in the form of a dove. Or, you know, I, I, thought, I thought I would be filled with the Holy Spirit. And I just wasn't. He was just an old man putting his hands on my head. And um, I think my main attitude to religion is actually disappointment. I feel, I feel very let down by God. Um, uh, I did do uh, what they used to call divinity, or sort of theology or religious knowledge for my A-level exam. So I actually know rather a lot about the Bible. And... Um, you, you think of the Bible as a, some sort of monumental document, but it, 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 it is actually an anthology. It's a collection of writings from all over the Middle East, uh, from different times. Um, there, are, there are analogous stories to Job, for example. There are analogous stories in the Middle East about, about the Great Flood, the Epic of Gilgamesh. Um, so I, I suppose I became emotionally distanced from religion and also intellectually distanced from it. But I remain very interested in it, and I think I'm still religious. But I, I get my religion from the love that I feel uh, for those that I love. I get my religion from beautiful sunsets. Um, I, have, I have these sort of rather Wordsworthy and moments of epiphany, say, if I climb to the top of a mountain in the Lake District. So I haven't lost my religiousness, but I have lost God. Um, and of course... It is very vexing the way that, that people use religion as a means of attacking each other or as an excuse to attack each other. Um, th there's one point where I say that you know, Jesus Christ and Muhammad must be sitting side by side in paradise, shaking their heads with dismay over what people have done with their, with their words. Um, and this is connected to a, a strong dislike for any kind of absolutist ideology. If you believe in something with enough certainty, it gives you your excuse to go around killing other people. So that is true of communism. It's true of Nazism. It was true of the, you know, the Italian fascists. And it's true of religions as well. So what I, what I actually want is uncertainty. I, want, I believe in uncertainty. And you, you can, but that doesn't actually stop you having you know, your, your, it, it doesn't actually deny one's religious nature to be uncertain. Is that an answer? Yeah. <laughs> um, it's not really a question, I think, but um, I can't remember which one of the trilogy it was that I was reading about a particular incident. And for the sake of those who haven't read the book, I wouldn't give too much details. But it's, a, it's an incident where there was a lot of violence uh, to a particular female character. And um, this my husband will remember very well. I remember just when I read that, I was screaming and shouting and like crying and just throwing the book across the room and swearing that I hated you and that I would never read your books again. And it was really, it was a very violent reaction on my part, but I think um, I, I gradually just, you know, I finished a trilogy and everything. But I think, I, I guess I, I wanted to say, 
I came to terms with it because I think maybe that was, and maybe you could confirm or maybe correct me, but I think um, that was your way, because I, I felt that you were writing it really casually, you know, like the way you wrote it. Um, and afterwards I thought maybe that's just the way you were portraying just how crazy such violence happened in every day. I guess it was modeled on Columbia. Um, and I just wanted to say, I mean, it was a very powerful um, section, a very powerful trilogy, a very powerful book. Um, so I, I don't know if you have anything to say about that particular Yeah, I've got incident. massive to say about that, um, especially that you're actually right. Um, when, when I wrote that passage, which is about the, the torturing to death of a young woman in a chrysanthemum house by cocaine thugs, um, I felt sick for two weeks after writing that. You might, have, you might have thought it was casual, but it cost me a lot emotionally. I felt sick for two weeks, and I stopped writing after that. I've never, ever written violence with the object of, being, of titillating. If, if I thought anyone was reading my books because they loved the violence, I would petition to have them executed. <laughs> so, um, violently. So, no. Um... I've, I've, only, I've tried to use violence only for its moral force. I, I wanted, in particular with that book, I had become interested in the terrible social effects of the cocaine trade in Colombia. The, the people in the cocaine trade had become so rich that they could do anything whatsoever. They could give a couple of million dollars to every prison guard in the country. There was no prison they could be locked in. So they, they started acting like ancient gods, absolutely capricious, absolutely immoral or amoral. Um, their violence was extraordinary. Um, it, they were doing things like abducting little girls from Indian villages and just raping them until they were, until they were thrown out of a car over a cliff, you know. They, they, because they, their, their absolute impunity, their total power, turned them into devils. And that's, what, that's one thing I was interested in, uh, I wanted the rest of the world to know that when, when, you, when you decadently stick that cocaine powder up your nose just for the sake of thinking that you're charming for a while, what you're actually doing is killing Colombians. You know, there's no way out of it. Um, I wanted the people in the West to understand that they were implicated in the most barbaric mass murder. Um, in Colombia, it was particularly horrible because in the 1950s, there was a long period called La Violencia, where the, le the, the, the liberals and the conservatives were, at, were uh, fighting a civil war. The communists stayed out. But, um, um, so, and and though you sent, for a conservative village would send a raiding party into a liberal village, and they, they developed these very complicated and horrible ways of torturing people to death. There was one where you, you stuck... You, which was death by a million pinpricks, where you just seeped to death. There was another, another one where you, you cut people up into tiny little slivers, one at a time, tiny little bits. It was really extraordinary. And after that civil war ended and the cocaine th thuggery began to increase, the cocaine thugs were using the same techniques as they had evolved in La Violencia for torturing people to death. And so there was a sort of a horrible tidal wave of sadism that those people brought with them. And that's why I wrote that horrible passage. I wanted people to know how horrible it was. So you were right. It was, it was about... Um, I, I, learnt, I learnt this lesson from a, a writer called Nicholas Montserrat, who's not well known now, but he, he had a massive success with a book called The Cruel Sea, which was about... Uh, just ordinary people are coping with the hardship of being on the Atlantic convoys in the Second World War. And uh, th there's a character in this book called Lockhart who is made into the ship's doctor. Ships don't normally have doctors. The only reason he was made the ship's doctor was because his father was a doctor. He himself knew nothing about it. And th there's a really disturbing uh, account in that book of a ship being torpedoed and the sailors, jump, the crew jumping off into the, into the sea where, which is full of oil and the oil catches fire. So these sailors are swimming in an ocean of blazing oil. 
and one of these poor characters is dragged onto the ship and all that, the, all that this man Lockhart has to treat him with is a tube of anti-burn cream. And so he's, he's rubbing the anti-burn cream on, onto this poor fellow who's all burnt and the flesh is just coming off. And, and he's, Lockhart is saying, just die, please die, please die, because that was the only solution. So when the man died, he's actually relieved. And I found this deeply shocking, um, but shocking in exactly the right way, because the one thing that those who are romantic about war need to know is, is just actually how horrible it is when it happens. So, you know, that I've, I've only ever used violence or horror, I think, uh, in, in a moral way. Do you and how often do you reread what you've written and how do you deal with mistakes? And sometimes not necessarily mistakes, but things that you wouldn't have done now as a more mature writer, things that you've written much earlier in your career. Well, do you know the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam? It's a Persian poem. There's, there's a verse in that which goes, the moving finger writes and having writ moves on. Nor all your piety nor wit can lure it back to cancel half a line. Nor all your tears wash out a word of it. There's absolutely nothing you can do about it, is there? You're stuck with it. It's, that's why it's important to pay attention when you're doing it. <laughs> yeah. You mentioned earlier the importance of um, the narrative and character in your work. I believe that location is also very important, and it's not subservient to the um, narrative or development of the characters. Could you please tell us something about the importance of location in your work? I think it's wise for a writer to think of the location as one of the characters. So, locations, after all, do have a character. There was a French philosopher called Baudin who, th who thought that he thought some stupid things, such as that women couldn't be have any importance in social life because they didn't have beards. But he 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 also he, he also thought that a, a, nation, a nation's personality was conditioned by its geography, and there is a certain amount of truth in that. It's, it's obvious that you live in the, if you live in the Arctic, you develop into a certain kind of person. If you live in the mountains, you become another kind of person. Um, if you live in the fens of Norfolk, near where I live, you definitely become a different kind of person. So um, I, think, I think also one should, one should say that um, writing ought to be a pleasure. I enjoy writing. I love doing it. If I hear a writer saying, oh, I hate it, it's such drudgery, oh, I don't know why I do it, I, I think either you're lying or you're in the wrong job. Writing ought to be a pleasure. And I think that relishing a location is part of the pleasure of writing. So it's part of my pleasure in writing. Um, I have written nostalgically about the village where I grew up, for example, and that was for the pleasure of the nostalgia. I, I've written about you know, a, a Greek island, where that was just for the, really, the joy of that intense light, the unbelievable intense light of, of, of Greece. Um, it's, you know, that can make you believe in the divine. Um, How did you come across Paraguay? Paraguay? Paraguay. Oh, Kayakoi. Yes. Sorry, Kayakoi. Well, for those of you who don't know, Kayakoy is a ruined village in, in Likia in southwest Turkey um, where there used to be a, a mixed community of Muslims and Christians, uh, probably all of them Turkish speaking, although the, the, the Christians are often referred to inaccurately as Greeks. They were Greek Orthodox, but they were not Greek. They were, they were Ottoman Christians. But anyway, this, this village... Um, was destroyed so socially when the Christians were deported to Greece after a particularly horrible war between Greece and Turkey in the early 1920s. And so the village was destroyed socially back then. 
Then in the 1950s, there was a devastating earthquake, which just pretty much made it unlivable in. And the local people came and pillaged the building materials for their own houses elsewhere. And the village is now a picturesque ruin and a tourist attraction. And that's the reason I came across it. I just went to it as a tourist. But when I saw what had been there, I, I, it occurred to me that I really ha it was an ideal setting for a novel. What got me going was that the Christians who used to live there were the kind that used to dig up the dead after five years. The women would dig up the dead, they would wash the bones in wine, wrap the wine in a linen cloth, you'd, write, you'd put a cross on the skull and the name of the person, and you would stack these bones in an ossuary. Now, there were two ossuaries in the village, in Kayakoi, and there's almost no bones left now. Almost none. You, you might be lucky to find a tooth. And um, so um, now, if you, I, I looked at these osseries with no bones in, and I thought, what happened to the bones? Because Muslims don't disturb the dead. It's very much taboo for Muslims to disturb the dead. And the Muslims wouldn't have moved those bones. Um, so I realized what had happened was that the, when the Christians left, instead of taking pots and pans with them, they, actually, they took the bones of their relatives and their ancestors. They carried the bones of their loved ones all the way to Greece. And that this was such a powerful idea that I, that's actually what made me want to write that whole novel just for the sake of that one image of the Christians leaving with their bags of bones. Uh, what are you uh, working on at the moment for publication in the near future, please? Well, I've, I've got a book of poetry out next month, of which I have the only copy, <laughs> so you can't have it. Um, the, there's a Greek poet I love very much called Constantine Kavafis, who lived in Alexandria in North Africa, and he... he he wrote about, the, I suppose, the erotic life. He wrote about the ancient world, and he wrote a lot of poems which are for basically philosophizing or giving people advice. And I always travel with, um, with Kavafi in my pocket. It's the ideal kind of thing to have on an airplane. And in fact, I have a translation of Kavafi here. So, um, as I said, it, we are like computers, and if, if you, you tend to write the kind of things that you read. So, um, I've written a lot of verses, either in his manner or in his honour, or that I think he might have liked. And they're all in this collection. So, um, so this is my Kavafi tribute volume. But I've, I've also, last week I just finished a novel, which is a huge trilogy, I think, which is going to be a family saga going from 1914 until 1980. And it was originally based on the life of one of my grandfathers, who was a wanderer. Um, so he had an interesting life. But I, I don't actually know enough about my family to, to write a history of my family, so it's very rapidly degenerated into lies. <laughs> so, but uh, I'm, 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 quite, I'm quite pleased with it. It was very hard to write because... The First World War is actually an inexhaustible subject. You can never write too much about it. You don't know where to stop. Um, it, it is a big problem, I think, knowing what to leave out. It's, it's as important knowing what to leave out as knowing what to put in. But anyway, I hope that this book will be out next year in time for the centenary of 1914. Any questions from the floor? Um, you have two movies. Uh, you have two of your books have been made into movies. Were you surprised to be um, approached um, by, by Hollywood and the, the whole movie thing? No, I, I wasn't surprised because I, 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 although I, I have never written a book with the idea that, oh, this will be a good film... It, I thought Captain Corelli's Mandolin would be a good film. Um, 
I was surprised to be approached about getting Red Dog made into a film because making films about animals is notoriously difficult. Um, animals um, mostly do what they want. And um, even a dog who, who's, who, who just wants to please you, he doesn't want to do it all the time. Um, but they, 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 they did find this marvelous dog called Coco who could apparently be trained to do anything. And, and so um, they did manage to make the film with almost no computer-generated um, images whatsoever. There was only one comic episode where they, where they had a, a, the dog fighting a cat. And you can't actually do that on a real film because people would protest about cruelty to animals. Mm -hmm. now, the dog probably would have lost, actually, because that cat was a real bastard. But um, <laughs> the cat... <laughs> Yeah, red dog has a fight with red cat. And re red cat was trained to hiss on command. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> Extraordinary. Oh, what animals would do with it for us. But, um, so I was surprised that that was made into a film, and I think it's a particularly good film. It's rather sentimental, which I don't mind too much. But it's also very funny. I have been approached for, about films for most of my other books as well, but it's just that it, it, the film industry... It's so unpredictable and capricious. And it's a lot to do with luck. My first novel was optioned by somebody who suddenly died of bowel cancer, so that was that off. You know, my next book, oh, um, the one where there's the horrible death, was optioned by um, Ian Softley, who then sort of went on to do something else. He's the guy who made Wings of a Dove. Um, I'm, I'm currently working on the third version of the script for Birds Without Wings, which I thought is such a vast novel, it's unfilmable but we've managed to pare it down into something that might fit into a couple of hours. Um, a Partisan's Daughter is my most obviously filmable book and no one's interested at all. So, so I know. It's, um, people think that films are far more glamorous than novels, much more interesting. They're really thrilled for you if your novel's made into a film. But actually, I'm f I think novels are far more glamorous than films, and I'm much more pleased to be published than I am to have one of my books made into a film. No, then um, thank you very much for Mr. Pleasure. Louis de Bernier and Mr. Chip Chow for the today's session. And of course, our special thanks to all of you for joining us today.